As we have previously explored on Words and Coffee, New Jersey boasts the highest number of Superfund sites in the country. Before we were commuter suburbs arguing about what to call John Taylor's gift to humanity, the Garden State featured a great deal of industry in support of the various war efforts. And yes, there were conflicts besides World Wars I and II. In 1940, even before the U.S. experienced a date that would live in infamy, the Hercules Commercial Explosives Factory was hard at work, churning out long-range landscape adjustment tools in the big struggle against the Austrian painter. Pun fully intended, this was a booming time for those who made booms. Now, any business comes with a certain level of risk. Depending on the particulars, maybe the investors will lose their money, maybe you'll get some public backlash for a gaffe, or maybe you'll blow up a town. Welcome to Words and Coffee, where we talk interesting history about the Garden State and enjoy a cup of small batch roasted goodness. Today's brew from Patriot Craft Coffee, and the history is the 1940 Hercules explosion in Kenville, New Jersey. Let's get to it. Now, if you already watched my video on the Navy Hill explosion at Picatinny Arsenal, you might already know the area. Kenville is a small borough in the town of Roxbury at the former site of the Hercules Powder Company, spin-off from DuPont. Originally established in 1872, it was the second dynamite factory built in the country, and by 1940, it was the third largest, producing smokeless powder as well as dynamite. They also had something of a abysmal safety record by modern standards. The Kenville location experienced some 100 incidents of varying degrees of severity, with six fatalities occurring in the first half of 1940 alone. The facility, located between what is today Route 80 and Route 46 along Howard Boulevard, consisted of about two square miles. At the time, they were expanding. See, in 1940, the U.S. had not yet entered the war, but were drafting up plans for well, a draft. The Conscription Act was national news, and with the expectation that the U.S. would eventually get involved, not to mention the weapons and ammo we were already selling to Europe, the government decided that we needed to increase production. Hercules had recently been awarded a contract to double production of smokeless powder, creating an entirely new line to help them meet quota. This consisted of some 25 buildings, all supporting the various processes required to make smokeless powder with a capacity of 20,000 pounds. Additionally, the complex contains storage buildings for nitroglycerin, also produced on site, and the main ingredient for dynamite. Keep that in mind. That was a lot of work, and work meant jobs. Many of the Herc's 1,200 employees lived in the surrounding towns of Ledgewood and Mine Hill. Jobs meant food on the table, and despite the sporadic occurrence of explosive accidents, the Herc plant was an established cornerstone of the community proving once again that people can become accustomed to just about anything. But nothing could prepare them for the events of September 12, 1940. September the 12th was a Thursday, because history had already decided that September 11th and Friday the 13th were reserved. Shortly after lunch, second shift was coming on to continue operations, Many of the workers were new, having been on the job for just a matter of weeks, and around 1.35 in the afternoon, when they heard a strange wump sound, many of them became alarmed. Edward Powers, a worker in the nitroglycerin building, looked outside and saw red flames pouring out the windows of the Solvent Recovery Building, or SRB. The 100 prior incidents notwithstanding, it took only a few seconds to realize that this incident would be unlike any that had come before it. Without getting into a chemistry lesson, all you need to know about the SRB is that excess ether and alcohol are extracted from the powder slurry before the wet powder moves on to drying. And the other thing you need to know about ether and alcohol is that they are both easily vaporized and easily ignited. Whatever its cause, the fire originated in this building. Upon hearing this initial smaller explosion, Fred Prandato, a veteran employee in the powder mixing building, reassured his novice work partner that a powder press probably went up, something that happened with some frequency and was otherwise nothing to worry about. 
That was until just a few seconds later, when the brick wall he was standing next to burst inward, knocking him down and burying him in debris. According to Claude Van Sleet, another worker who was standing about 150 feet away from the SRB and saw the second explosion, he described it as if the building had folded in the middle and then sprang in every direction all at once. The contents had just gone high order. <laughs> Pieces of the building flew in every direction. Metal, wood, chunks of masonry, driven by the shockwave, scattered all across the property. Worse yet, much of it was on fire. A chain reaction had just been initiated. Following the blast, workers fled in all directions, desperate to find refuge from the fire, but the damage had been done, and it wasn't over. Subsequent blasts, started by the scattered fire, set off energetic material in another seven buildings which in total contained approximately 34,000 pounds of nitroglycerin. For comparison, a standard stick of dynamite contains about a quarter of one pound. The blasts were spaced about two minutes apart, and the resulting crater was 300 yards long, 50 yards across, and 20 yards deep. To visualize that, we're talking about three football fields set up end-to-end -end deeper than a five-story building, and the destruction was massive and the effects were felt far beyond the Hercules property. The shockwave snapped trees off at the base, windows were broken for over a mile out, injuries among residents were rampant. A woman named Olive White lived about half a mile from the blast and was having lunch with her mother and brother at the time. She was injured by shrapnel when her window exploded inward. The same thing happened to another woman named A.W. Streak, who was actually in good spirits afterward. See, her husband and sons were all employees at the plant and were working the day of the explosion. Ironically, they all came out unscathed, and it was just mom staying at home who had sustained injury. So too were the students at the local high school, then on Main Street. Ulysses Todd reported that students were thrown from their seats. As before, most of the injuries were due to flying glass and debris. One hundred students were cut serious enough to warrant medical attention. Back at the plant, the survivors began searching for the injured. Fred Prandato, from the nitroglycerin building, and who had been buried under a pile of bricks, took twenty minutes to dig himself out. Everything around him was on fire. Dazed and hurt, he was found by two workers and guided to an improvised triage area. After getting bandaged up, he made his way back home, and his mother put him to bed. He was among the lucky ones. The blast had knocked out the facility's power plant, which in turn disabled the fire suppression system. In addition to the fire, survivors had to navigate hazards like venting steam and leaking acid vats and black smoke. Local police soon responded to assist the rescue and prevent onlookers from venturing into the danger zone. Mothers and wives and sisters swarmed the gate trying to get news, desperate to know whether their men were among the wounded or dead. Injured and shell-shocked workers wandered the streets of Roxbury like zombies, their clothes tattered. By 4 o'clock p.m., 35 bodies had been recovered and identified but the butcher's bill was still being tallied. 250 of the injured were taken to Dover General Hospital, which only had capacity for 96 patients. They did the best they could. Surgeons and nurses from a dozen neighboring towns arrived to augment Dover's staff. Overflow patients were sent to St. Mary's Church, and one nurse even opened her basement to a dozen injured. Secretary of the Navy Charles Edison, a New Jersey native, personally requested aid from President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That afternoon, the Red Cross showed up to establish a field hospital, and as an interesting aside, Charles Edison would resign following this incident in order to run for governor of New Jersey. His father was Thomas Edison. Yes, that Thomas Edison. In all, 75 departments answered the call. 20 towns sent aid in one form or another. The factory grounds were a flattened, charred ruin. The final death toll would stand at 51, with another 250 being injured. Now, if that was the whole story, this wouldn't be a words and coffee video. There is a part two to this incident, and it's a bit of a doozy. So then as now, because this explosion involved defense contractors and thus assets of national interest and security, that pulled in the FBI from the Newark field office. 
The investigation was aided by county sheriff, state police, and in particular, the anti-sabotage division, because pretty much right from the beginning, the thought on everyone's mind was, someone did this on purpose. But who? Well, Denton Quick, Sussex County Sheriff, helpfully provided a list of 310 names of, quote, potential fifth columnists, many of whom were employed as machinists and draftsmen in various defense support roles. But it would turn out none of them were at Hercules. Hmm. 310 names. Boy, that was quick. Uh, pun not intended. But seriously, he had that list of names, like, ready to go. Why is that? So I told you that story, so I can tell you this story. Camp Nordland, located in Andover, about 15 miles away from Hercules, was a rural club for those Americans of a certain Germanic persuasion. For those of you who aren't familiar with the American Bund, the oversimplified version is that they were American Nazis. That comes with an asterisk, since the club itself preceded the Austrian painter's rise to power. It started as a weekend retreat for German-Americans to drink beer, sing songs of the fatherland, and converse in their native tongue. And really, no one had a problem with that. It's just that with Germans, they tend to have two speeds. Knee slap and goose step. For another example, see my Garrett Mountain video. It wasn't until the 30s, with the rise of National Socialism in the Fatherland, that most of the moderate knee slap crew was pushed out of the club by the goose step brigade. And this wasn't a small club. Its opening ceremonies drew something like 10,000 attendees. For comparison, the town of Andover had a population of 500 at the time. And at first, they were happy to have the extra business in town. Now, upon ejecting the moderates from the club, the Andover chapter started hosting some true believers, such as the Ku Klux Klan and American Bundesleiter Fritz Kuhn, a man who had the personal blessing of Mustache Man himself. This earned them the attention of the Dyes House Committee of Un-American Activities. The Dyes Committee was the fourth iteration of Congress looking into subversives, and mostly overshadowed by the far more well-known but perpetually misrepresented McCarthy hearings. A story for another time. Testimony before Congress accused fascist and Nazi sympathizers, and yes, those last two are distinct, of making plans to hinder war production for the purpose of ultimately aiding the Axis powers. The takeaway here is that the Dyes Committee, for the year leading up to the Hercules explosion, had been sounding the alarm on sabotage in a huge way. So, when 30% of gunpowder production suddenly goes up in smoke, and not in the good way, this apparently vindicated everything they had been saying. And to be fair, it's not like they were entirely off base. The Black Tom explosion of 1918 was found to be the result of explosives planted by German agents. However, when Camp Nordland was raided on September 16th, just four days after Hercules went up, authorities found nothing. None of the members worked at Hercules, there were no written plans, just a few German language pamphlets, and the only weapon was a single scoped rifle. Innocuous enough. While Nordland may have been suspicious as anything, and of potentially dubious loyalty, Ultimately, they were probably just a pro-collectivist Wignat social club with really bad optics. And also, if they really did have violent intent, do you think they would have a giant clubhouse that could be raided and disbanded? I think not. Now, as a <clears throat> strictly academic exercise, a T-ist cell generally needs a more fluid structure, hypothetically. They'd be looking for something that could group and ungroup as needed in order to avoid detection and law enforcement. For example, they would need someone who could, I don't know, plant bricks ahead of an organized protest and then disappear into the crowd so they couldn't be caught. And the Bund just isn't that. And besides, the Goose Step Brigade is just too loud and too proud about what they're about for something like that. However, there was another group operating at the same time that more realistically fits this bill. For a moment, picture yourself as a German sympathizer circa 1940. You want to support the fatherland, and that means hindering the Allied war effort, which at the time primarily means Britain. Who are your friends here? Certainly not the US, they were actively supporting your enemy. Hmm, who else hates England? 
Could it be this little island missing its northern tip? One with an established history of planting bombs, for example? Without getting into the entirety of Irish history, the rise of Sinn Féin, and the various peace accords, all you really need to know is that Northern Ireland exists separate from Green Ireland, and there are some strong opinions about this. The IRA, or Irish Republican Army, being among the loudest voices in the room and historically have alternated between periods of relative dormancy to heightened activity. Now, regardless of your opinions and sympathies on this matter, which is worthy of debate, what is indisputable is that the Irish car bomb is more than just a drink. In fact, from 1939 to 1940, right around the time that the Dyes Committee was concerned over potential attacks on U.S. war production facilities, the IRA was executing the S-Plan, a bomb campaign in England. But that's across the ocean, right? How do you go from Irish separatist movement in the United Kingdom to an explosion in North Jersey? Well, enter two individuals named Faust and Rakowski. In a nutshell, Faust was born in Germany but became a citizen through military service. However, he later rediscovered an affection for the fatherland and returned home to offer his services to the Abwehr, Nazi intelligence. They set him up with Rakowski, an Austrian businessman who operated internationally. Now here's where it gets spicy. Through his coordination with the IRA in the UK, Faust discovered the existence of an IRA cell in New York City. Upon communicating this to German command, they tasked Rakowski with activating it. He arrived in America in June 1940, three months before the Herc explosion. In fact, according to secret intelligence in the 20th century, Rakowski would go on to claim responsibility for the attack as the first of several. That November, two months after the Herc explosion, three additional war production assets in New Jersey and Pennsylvania would meet with similar disaster. And that would seem to be a neat and tidy explanation. However, it's not perfect. In researching this, I found only one reference to Rakowski, which ultimately comes down to the above-mentioned book. And his alleged claim of responsibility is mentioned as a simple statement of fact in one sentence. Also worth mentioning is that that book comes from a UK publisher, one that, it could be argued, has an incentive to attribute guilt to the IRA. To be fair, I don't know how Rakowski got tied to this. Was there congressional testimony? What? Seriously, though, if someone can tell me, I will drop whatever I'm doing and update this video. However, given the lack of solid records, I have to label this as alleged. And as so often seems to be the case, One final thing to consider. Hercules was one of the largest operations in the country and had a long history of job site accidents. This was not the first explosion, nor would it be the last. The Solvent Recovery Building was new and had been in operation for only a week when it exploded. The facility as a whole had recently been expanded and there were a lot of new workers. That is, inexperienced workers. I am not prepared to rule out the accident theory. However, Neither can we ignore the fact that three additional explosions occurred just two months later at other facilities. And there were two other accidents at Herc that same year, and that's really all I can say about that. Regardless of its true cause, 51 workers died in the 1940 explosion, memorialized at a 2005 ceremony, along with an additional 21 workers who were also killed during various accidents over the company's tenure at Kenville. One final explosion would occur in 1989, shattering windows all across town. And in 1996, they would cease operations for the last time. Today, the property is fenced off, but last I heard, there was construction and cleanup going on. Probably going to be townhouses, because that's how we roll in New Jersey. That'll about do it for me. If you stuck with me this far, thank you so much for watching. Sources in the description. This has been Words and Coffee. Until next time.